So I will be giving a brief introduction. Um, then Mandy and Estella will present on their research. Um, and we will wrap up the presentation with a discussion and Q&A for about 20 minutes. And then very briefly at the end, um, we're gonna talk about the future of this work and outline some next steps for further engagement. So to begin with some quick background um, at the Global Disaster Preparedness Center or the GDPC, as we call it, uh, we are a resource center for the Global Red Cross and Red Crescent Network of 191 national societies. And we're hosted at, at the American Red Cross. Um, in a nutshell, we promote innovation and disaster preparedness and we're really committed to learning and knowledge sharing amongst disaster preparedness practitioners worldwide. Um, this involves often engaging in shared research and hosting learning webinars such as what we're doing today. Also a strong focus of our work has always been on youth preparedness and school safety. And we released a couple years back in partnership with UNESCO and Open Dream, um, a couple of mobile gaming apps focused on disaster risk reduction and resilience education, targeting youth and leveraging gamification. Um, with the popularity of these apps and with the growing recognition, I think amongst all of us, um, of emerging tech and the challenges and opportunities it presents for our work, we commission this research to learn more and contribute to a growing evidence base and further guide our work in school disaster preparedness. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our consultants, Mandy George and Estella Liva. Um, they conducted the research and wrote this, this excellent report and case studies. Uh, Mandy George is an independent consultant specializing in humanitarian innovation, including in the fields of community engagement and accountability, environmental sustainability, and climate change adaptation. Mandy has worked with the Red Cross movement for over 13 years and also has experience working with UN OCHA, UNEP, and other humanitarian environmental organizations. Estella is a, direct, a digital director and researcher specializing in how new tech and the internet impact human behavior, society, and our surroundings. She is the founder and director of Digital and Nomad, a digital agency and studio creating digital products and immersive experiences for clients from the nonprofit and commercial sectors, including the UN and the Red Cross. And she has directed projects for a variety of institutions, including Somerset House and Mobile World Capital, among others. So with no further ado, I will turn the mic over to Mandy and Estella to share their work. And again, if you have any questions uh, during their presentation, please do type them in the chat box and we will answer them. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, Bonnie, for the introduction. Um, it's Mandy George here. Um, and it's really great to be here with my colleague Estela Oliva to be presenting our research, um, which we really, really, really enjoyed doing and are, and are thrilled to be discussing with you all here today. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, as Bonnie has alluded to already, um, the goal of this research was to provide information and options to all organizations globally who are interested in pursuing immersive technologies and serious gaming um, as a disaster preparedness or risk reduction educational tool for schools. And we, had, we have two major outputs from this research. So we have one, um, literature review and meta-analysis, our main reports, which you may have seen, and if not, um, we encourage you to take a look at it after this because we are presenting here basically a summary. Um, it's impossible to cover everything that the report does, so please do take a look at it. Um, the meta-analysis looks at the shortcomings of traditional um, school-based DRR and provides some solutions and new models um, with XR technologies um, and innovative practices. Um, and then we have a series of 10 case studies. Um, these span different types of technologies, different sectors. Um, what we wanted to do with these case studies was to document the intersection of emerging technologies and disaster risk reduction and preparedness education, um, capture the breadth of technologies that are out there that are being used or could be used for school safety. Um, also, we wanted to identify good practices, effective approaches, um, and some of the technological features that can support disaster preparedness programming in schools. Um, and we made the selection of the case studies based on their relevance for school-based DRR, um, the work of the Global Disaster Preparedness Center, um, and also the desire to have a range of technologies and innovations represented, um, and also give some examples from both um, in and out of the Red Cross movement as well. 
Um, so we gathered data um, for this study um, through three primary methods. Um, so we conducted a range of approximately 20 semi-structured interviews, um, or better said, with 20 organizations. Um, this included um, immersive technology experts from academic institutions, digital agencies, um, re research consultancies, and also focal points who have developed um, XR experiences uh, with or for humanitarian agencies. Um, and then we conducted an extensive review of the existing XR research literature and experiences that already exist, um, including the case studies, um, and then um, also using our own um, background and expertise um, in these fields. So we're going to start off by giving you a little bit of background on the context of school-based disaster risk reduction for those of you that don't work specifically in this field. Um, so school-based uh, DRR, or SBDRR for short, um, is a really core part of the work of the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement um, and Red Cross Red Crescent National Societies uh, across the world. Um, national societies have a unique position to influence the topic of school safety, um, given their existing relationships with national governments um, and the support they have from a large number of volunteers. Um, Activities around school safety are usually run through um, disaster management or health programs, um, uh, branches as well with volunteers. Um, and for school disaster preparedness and risk reduction, um, Red Cross National Societies usually work across um, the three pillars of the comprehensive school safety framework, um, which is uh, defined by UNDRR. You can see that in the slide here. Um, and this research that we're presenting today is most relevant for pillars two and three, um, given that pillar one focuses a bit more on infrastructural issues rather than activities um, directly linked to teachers and students. Um, so the target audience of SBDRR um, and therefore the use of immersive technologies um, in schools um, covers uh, both adults and children and young people. So of course students as a primary audience um, but very importantly, also teachers who are an essential vehicle to deliver school safety messages to children um, and who shouldn't be overlooked um, in terms of receiving training and knowledge as well. Uh, parents too, students often act as a vehicle to deliver knowledge to their parents, um, which can sometimes be the only source of disaster education in the family. Um, local authorities and community leaders who are of course critical for making community level decisions on disaster preparedness activities. And then last but certainly not least, um, Red Cross Red Crescent branches and volunteers. Um, school disaster preparedness in national societies is often led by local branches and volunteers um, who are trained and then pass on that knowledge uh, to schools. So they're a very important conduit for uh, information. So we, for this research, um, picked out the activities um, of school-based disaster risk reduction that we believed were the most relevant to the potential for immersive technologies. Um, and so these three main categories are how we base our um, gap analysis, which we'll speak a little bit later on, um, looking at some of the shortcomings of these core activities uh, when delivered through traditional methods um, and some of the opportunities for XR. So these activities are firstly disaster awareness raising. So this could be dissemination of awareness raising materials, um, organization of campaigns, competitions, et cetera, um, disaster drills and simulations, um, and then training. So this could be either first aid training or broader disaster management training, for example, in specific standard operating procedures for hazards. Um, so we will return to those very shortly um, to look at some of the, to look at the gap analysis. Um, but firstly, I'd like to pass over to Estella, who's going to give us an overview of the technology landscape. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Hi, everyone. Um, so just giving a little bit of context of uh, immersive technologies in the context of this research. We are not interested so much in just the technology, but in how this technology can enable learning and training uh, for, this, for this purpose. So, as you all know, uh, recent research claims that these technologies will, will be one of the key mediums in the coming years, and there are many uh, headsets and devices able to use, as well as smartphones being enabled with powerful cameras and sensors that allows for these technologies to be, to be seen and experienced. 
So I guess the good news for us is the entertainment and tech industries are pushing really hard for manufacturing and distribution of accessible uh, devices. So this brings an incredible potential for use in the humanitarian sector and more specifically in the science of preparedness with the new generations. So some of the considerations in the use of these technologies uh, are the, scale, the scalability of these solutions, uh, especially as we have seen the target audiences really range from, they're very varied and they range from the developers to the students and the school staff and the parents and everyone around them. So for the purpose of, of this research, we have focused mostly on virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, we also understand that extended reality or XR, which composes all kinds of different technologies mixed in a, in a space, it's something that we, we might not be focusing so much at the moment. So for virtual reality, uh, the key element is that um, this experience entails a full immersion in the virtual environment. So the, this means that the user um, is fully immersed and it replaces the existing reality with a new virtual reality, which includes visual, audio, and even sensorial performances. So usually experienced through a headset with controllers, uh, you know, there are different types of VR, which, which range from VR with a smartphone and a simple cardboard headset to VR with uh, haptic wearables, for example. Um, recently, the standalone devices um, has been a really interesting field, I think, for, for us, uh, as it offers high quality performance at an affordable price and little expertise required. So we think that standalone uh, full VR would be perfect for humanitarian practitioners and school staff. Um, augmented reality that you will know superimposes virtual layers into physical reality and allows to modify the way we perceive the world, being a perfect uh, marriage for disaster simulations because it will be able to transform the place where you're located into a disaster zone in the course of, of seconds. There are different types of AR and this is changed, changing really fast with current developments in software and and hardware. The way to experience AR is through uh, smartphones uh, and tablets which have cameras as well as headsets and, uh, and even, even glasses. Next slide. So just some, consider some quick considerations uh, with the use of any new technology. <clears throat> Anyone uh, that is using a new technology should have a dedicated onboarding time to really understand what they're gonna do and why. Of course, there are some hygiene and safety procedures and we strongly recommend moderation, meaning taking breaks. Um, so one of the areas that we found really interesting uh, in this research was the lack of information around age recommendations. Um, you know, children and young people are avid users of digital technologies and video games, however, there are no official standard bodies that uh, give you recommendations about how these technologies could be used and what effects they have in the children. So we have created a little chart here with uh, some age ranks and, and some just key points um, that the age of seven, for example, is a really, uh, seven to eight is a critical point in which the, uh, the child has concrete operational cognitive development. So that means that they're able to identify uh, what's reality versus what's fiction. Um, so from then on, uh, they're able to, to identify that what they see is uh, it's a fictional simulation versus before that. Another age that is uh, really important is the age of 13. That is the age recommended by the uh, headset makers and is kind of the, the cutoff <laughs> point for uh, starting to, to be inside uh, more realistic simulations in virtual reality. However, from our point of view, we recommend that for fully interactive immersive spaces, the age should be 18 year old. 
So in the case, of, just sorry, just going back a little bit. In the case of AR, of course, the impact is different because the content can be viewed through uh, screen devices rather than headsets. So this allows the technology to be more aligned with content recommendations. And aside from the technology, one really important aspect to consider that we're going to discuss here during the talk is the nature of the content and how this content might influence or even traumatize the children. Thank you, Estella. So um, a main part of our uh, both report and, and what we're presenting here today is um, looking at a gap analysis of some of the limitations of traditional school-based DRR activities um, that have been documented um, by various organizations um, and the opportunities of um, immersive technologies to address these limitations. Um, we really firmly believe and the research shows that immersive technology not only has the potential to address some of these shortcomings, um, but can go even beyond addressing them to adding value um, to disaster preparedness or risk reduction learning outcomes, um, which ultimately contributes towards protecting and saving more lives. Um, we do, though, like to, um, to stress, and this is very important, that we, we do not advocate that immersive technology should replace traditional teaching methods, um, in particular methods that are proven to work. Um, any use of, of technology shouldn't recreate education that's functioning well as it already is, um, but should utilize the unique advantages of the technology to bring added value um, to what is already in practice with other learning modalities, um, really targeting the shortcomings and providing solutions um, where the technology is accessible, scalable, and affordable. Um, so we address the, the shortcomings by main activity, as I, as I spoke about earlier. And so the first one being disaster awareness raising activities. Um, so the goal of um, awareness raising activities is really that students develop um, knowledge, understanding and skills on disaster management. Um, and this is an area where we've seen a lot of creativity across the sector um, that's been shown um, in harnessing technology already um, to increase learning outcomes. For example, there are various uh, mobile phone apps and digital games focused on this activity. Um, in general, however, we usually see that students can, can be passive recipients, recipients of knowledge, um, not so involved in the creation and delivery of these messages. Um, this can lead to low levels of motivation, uh, knowledge retention, and understanding of real hazard effects. Um, so XR technologies have the ability to tackle this. They can motivate students, they can improve learning outcomes and knowledge retention. Um, they still have quite a big wow factor. Um, and um, they have an ability to visually represent what is often um, delivered at the moment by verbal or written methods. Um, so um, I'll just run through a couple of the shortcomings and potential solutions now around uh, disaster awareness raising activities. Um, so firstly, participation and motivation. So as I mentioned before, often students are passive recipients of information rather than being actively engaged in the activity. Um, they can lack participation and motivation due to the methods of the delivery with low engagement, um, perhaps some that are slightly outdated. Um, so XR really has a huge opportunity here to increase engagement and motivation. Um, the wow factor is certainly there for, for example, augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, that may wear off one day, but it's still a long way off, I believe, especially in some parts of the world that maybe have had slightly less exposure to these technologies so far. Um, and this was really the case for all the case studies that we, we documented. This was a real advantage. Um, VR has also been um, proven to change behaviors um, through learning by doing. So, Research has proven that users' behavior can change when they're using virtual reality because it makes them feel more personally accountable or responsible for the action um, in each scene that they're in, which then transforms into a higher degree of participation and engagement. Um, for example, immersive VR is proven to enhance the enthusiasm of children for fire safety skills training. Um, and this is a topic that can often be seen as quite boring by children. Um, none of us really are that into doing fire drills, but we know how important they are. Um, so this can add a level of uh, both motivation and behavior change. Um, virtual reality has also been proven to impact on decision-making processes, um, which is really critical when training students and teachers in drills. 
as well, um, as no one emergency will be the same. And it's, it's key that both students and teachers have, uh, are able to critically think around their um, evacuation responses. Um, another factor is knowledge acquisition, retention, and application. So uh, through traditional forms of school-based CRR, it is sometimes difficult to apply the knowledge gained through um, traditional methods um, to real life contexts. Um, it's, it's been shown that even students who are very strong academically um, are often unable to apply what they've learned uh, to similar real world um, contexts. I mean, disasters can be very abstract um, if they haven't been experienced in, in real life before. Um, and so immersive technologies with their emphasis on this learning by doing um, can really address the shortcoming through providing knowledge through a medium that makes the user feel that they've actually experienced the event. Um, and if you feel like you've actually experienced it, it's a lot easier to retain and apply the knowledge that's learned. Um, combining augmented reality with gamification and more broadly speaking, gaming mechanics um, are a really good way of leading to increased knowledge acquisition and retention. Um, the combination has shown really positive impacts on learning, um, reinforcing existing learning um, and gaining new knowledge um, also on behavior change uh, for disaster or health education. Um, we've seen some examples in our case studies of where gamification has um, uh, shown motivation to obtain a high score if, if, a, if a gaming kind of competition element is, is included, which uh, leads to increasing engagement as well. And then finally, visualization, visual representation. As I mentioned before, uh, a lack of understanding of real hazard effects due to a lack of visual representation, representation of hazards um, can mean that it's very hard to imagine what a disaster would be like if you haven't experienced it before. Um, and so uh, immersive technologies can really help to visualize concepts that are very hard to visualize, which is perfect for disasters, for hazards. Um, it can help to visually represent both the hazards and their impacts, whether that be in immersive VR, um, in headset or mobile augmented reality. Um, and it can make um, visible concepts that are really hard to explain. Um, and its research has demonstrated the beneficial use of augmented reality technology as a means of visualizing concepts. Um, and overall, visualization can lead to increased understanding of what experience the hazard would be like, experiencing it would be like, um, activating the memory of a visual representation of the hazard, which then leads to motivating uh, behavior change and increasing knowledge retention. So I'm going to continue talking about uh, some of the gaps in uh, disaster drills and evacuations. So uh, drills and evacuation simulations aim to empower people to act and survive in case of disaster. For example, by uh, practicing how to physically evacuate a school in, during an emergency. So the traditional approaches with you know, videos, posts, and seminars, courses, or evacuation drills are, are used during uh, evacuation training. However, there is little post-disaster research on the effectiveness of these drills and their role in the prevention of injuries and deaths, uh, except on research by children, uh, which highlights the need for more realistic simulations. So this is where uh, XR technologies come into place to address some of these shortcomings, particularly in uh, the main limitation of evacuation drills, which is to be able to difference a real world emergency and a simulated emergency, providing a major barrier to participant learning. So, participant learning. so by creating virtual simulations, um, XR technology such as VR a and AR can transform, as we said before, any school into a disaster zone and provide the perfect scenario to learn how to act in a given situation. At traditional drills, also do not incorporate situational awareness learning, which means the uh, learning the perception of the environment uh, around you and the elements around you, and also comprehend their meaning. Um, immersive technologies or experiences can create 
a realistic environment uh, where you can show the scope and understand the scope of a disaster in the actual location where the training is happening. For example, in the case study uh, disaster, scope, disaster scope, um, uh, an augmented reality application that reveals how flash floods would affect students by allowing them to be immersed in a flood situation in their school where they can see the water height uh, levels and all of their surrounding in their school and they can understand which areas of the school uh, could potentially be saved during the floods. Also traditional drills and evacuation simulations are costly in time and resources. They can, they can kind of fail from a ped pedagogical point of view as they require significant, significant logistical challenges including the staff, the venue, the materials. Uh, we all know, that, you know, they disrupt the activity of the school, making it hard to organize and repeat, and a lot of coordination is, is required. Uh, usually they are performed once, uh, and often uh, if, you know, if the drill is not expected, it's not, it hasn't gone unexpected, there is not enough flexibility to repeat. However, with, uh, XR opportunity, uh, with XR technology, <coughs> um, these, uh, these drills uh, would require significantly less logistical requirements once the technology and the solution has been made available and as long as the schools are able to use it without technological difficulties. This goes back to you know, our, our conversation about the type of technology to use. It is imperative that the technology we're offering to the schools is, is easy to understand and easy to implement. Um, so drills also, uh, traditional drills uh, always provide the same kind of level of scenario, whilst with um, immersive technologies, you could, for example, create different storylines in the same application, providing uh, different types of drills in the same day or experience. Um, another really interesting point that we have found is that the cost of uh, offering um, an immersive simulation versus the cost of providing uh, a traditional simulation is lower per student than in a traditional drill, so that's really also very interesting. And then moving over to uh, our final pillar, uh, training, first aid, and disaster management training. So basically, uh, in, in this area of research, we found um, that the topic of first aid training was not seen as interesting by trainees. So this was impacting on knowledge retention and learning outcomes. So with the use of extra technologies, this topic can be turned into engaging and interesting. We invite you to use the, for example, the Lifesaver VR application that is one of our case studies. We're probably gonna spend uh, time practicing and learning your, and improving your CPR skills. It's, it's really engaging. Um, and that's just one example, you know. And there's also another element of that Mandy has discussed as well of knowledge retention. So for any training uh, and disaster management uh, plans, uh, XR can uh, cover these gaps and facilitate learning by doing and putting all of the sort of conceptual knowledge into So we have some key learnings and analysis um, on <clears throat> the process of actually building and um, putting into action immersive reality experiences um, from, from the case studies, from our research. Um, so we just wanted to share with you here a few of the top highlights um, of the key learnings. Um, Please do see the, the full report um, for much more detail. Um, so these are really focused on the, the process, the process of making and using an XR experience rather than on the technology itself. Um, so first and foremost, it's really important to choose your learning outcomes first and then the technology that fits the needs. Um, when designing any educational experience, it's always best practice um, for an educational framework that presents why it makes sense um, to use a particular type of technology. 
Um, so learning outcomes first and then the tech media uh, to fit the needs um, is really important. Um, participatory design is critical as with any good um, design. Um, get your users involved, which of course in this case means um, students, teachers, local officials, um, government volunteers, etc. Um, we've seen from our, our research that um, particularly for immersive technologies, um, this participatory approach has been incredibly effective to ensure, um, for example, the accuracy of the content. Um, really important when dealing with disaster preparedness, um, when messages may need to be improved by government or maybe are set by government and um, in the case of the right products, national society would have to follow. Um, also really important for the relevance of the content um, and the ability to include the experience into the national disaster management curriculum if that's an option, which is always quite useful. Um, a user-focused participatory design process can be more time-consuming. In fact, it usually always is, but it really does ensure that the experience is going to be used post-development that is most relevant. So one of our case studies, which is called the Disaster Preparedness Simulator, uh, it's a VR simulation, um, they spent eight months developing it, um, but actually six of the eight months were spent on a co-design process where they developed scenarios, storyboards, and decision pathways um, together with schools, so teachers and students, and representatives from local government. Um, so it, that obviously brought some challenges and was time consuming, but was, in, was an incredibly important uh, part of the development. Um, and then any XR um, immersive solution should be customizable to the national and local contents to be to context to be scalable. So all countries have a different range of disasters. They have a different range of natural requirements for their standard operating procedures. Um, it's really important to customize any immersive solution um, to the national and local context to make it scalable across, let's say, the Red Cross movement or across the sector. Um, balancing realistic hazard representations with proactive solutions is another one of our um, key learnings. Um, this is basically, there's a dilemma that's often faced, I think, with really realistic simulations, is how to make hazards seem realistic at the same time as not being too scary. Um, it's important to get the balance right. Um, and so there are a couple of ingredients that are key for this. So firstly, that whatever the threatening stimuli that's being used to scare, it should be accompanied by recommendations that are perceived by the recipient as effective towards averting the threat. The recipient needs to feel capable of averting the threat and carrying out the recommendations. Um, and so if they're provided with a way to do something about the threat and feel empowered, um, then uh, it's not too scary and it becomes something empowering and proactive. Um, very very important to think about age considerations to make sure an appropriate level of realism is used, um, particularly for younger audiences. Um, you may, for example, wish to consider animations or low polygraphics for younger people. Um, but it is possible to create a, a sense of emergency in an experience um, that still maintains you know, attention and engages the user without being too traumatizing. Um, the Lifesaver VR app, which Estella mentioned earlier, does this really well. So definitely check it out. Um, different hazards require significant design differences. So for example, an earthquake simulation um, can have um, much longer and intricate storylines than a fire simulation. Um, certain immersive uh, technology mediums may be more appropriate for specific hazards as well. Um, at the time uh, of speaking, currently right now, um, it's quite hard with an augmented reality headset to simulate an earthquake, but it, it's very effective for flood and fire smoke, although this probably is going to change quite soon because technology is advancing so fast. Um, it's advisable to keep content simple and focus on specific key messages. Um, immersive technologies experiences are by nature quite short. They should be short. Um, so it's good to keep messages punchy and simple and that will have more impact. Uh, so for example, in the disaster scope, um, fire evacuation training, uh, the main message for children is that they should evacuate the premises by getting down on their knees and, and crawling and that's kind of what it's mainly focused on. Um, experiences should be designed to offer the best possible technical experience for users. This is really important to combat motion sickness. Um, 
And experiences should be integrated into a broader learning experience. Um, this is kind of the number one rule for XR delivery is that an experience should not be delivered in isolation. Um, they're usually short, um, can't cover everything. So it should be integrated into a broader learning experience um, that includes measurable learning outcomes. Um, lots of examples of this from the case studies um, of being integrated into curriculums um, that work really well. Um, and finally, um, the importance of sharing knowledge across the sector. We came across a lot of really interesting projects, initiatives um, that sit, you know, similar, uh, other members of similar organizations that didn't know about. Um, there's so much great stuff out there. So it's, it's good if we all keep sharing with each other going forward. Um, so once we, we have now analyzed some of the uh, shortcomings and learnings, we wanted to present some of the solutions that could be uh, developed and implemented in order to enhance uh, and increase the effectiveness of disaster preparedness. So starting with virtual simulations that are best recommended when uh, it's expensive, impractical or dangerous uh, to allow users to experience something, in the sim in, in something similar in the real world. This would be perfect for disasters. Uh, we could create uh, virtual simulations by using different techniques such as uh, 360 uh, video, which is the example at the top, or um, using 3D animated content with game engines such as Unity or Unreal. And these are some of the expected learning outcomes. We scroll through to the other another solution that could be really interested and we really believe that this might be the future uh, of XR for disaster preparedness is location-based experiences because they allow to overlay 3D content and immersive content in the physical space where the uh, students are placed and they can transform the school uh, and the facilities into a disaster zone in the course of seconds. They also allow for the possibility to scale much easier because they could be replicated across several locations. Um, and uh, this area actually is one of the areas that we have seen with augmented reality that is kind of developing at the fastest pace at the moment. Um, so we believe that is, it's gonna be really, really important and interesting uh, for disaster preparedness. Just wanted to show you a little video here of disaster scope, um, which shows the realistic uh, water uh, floods and, you know, for students in the school. <clears throat> it's kind of an amazing way to, to represent uh, physically there for them to, to understand what, what is happening during the flood. And you can't get more realistic than this, honestly. Um, advanced features in location-based experiences could be even to connect real-time data, such as data from earthquakes, tsunamis, um, into the experience to be able to actually uh, assess real, uh, get real data into, into your experience. And finally, another solution that we have discussed already is to integrate a digital game-based learning into any experience to increase engagement and learning performance uh, for, for students uh, and users to develop confidence and to uh, continue increasing their knowledge by repeating and practicing during gameplay. So we have um, <clears throat> finally um, some key recommendations to leave you with. Um, these again are just a few of the full list of recommendations from the report, um, which breaks them down into different categories from design, content, health and safety, through to uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, so first and foremost, um, Experience design. So it's incredibly important to make it age appropriate, make it participatory. We've already discussed that a little bit. Um, 
designing with diversity and inclusion is, is really critical. Um, it's really a responsibility because Immersive technologies have the potential to have impact in the real world in a major way, so we should apply the same principles as we would um, when not using immersive technologies. Um, following a design approach, which we call a triadic design approach that combines reality, meaning, and play, um, is advisable. So um, for children, young people, and adults, um, a triadic design that balances those three criteria is often successful. Um, how to um, decide on how much of each one of these ingredients um, will depend a little bit on the audience. So younger audiences do benefit usually from more play and less reality. Um, and then that scale grid shifting is moving through the age range. Um, forward planning based on forecasted advancements in technology, very important. Um, the landscape is changing so fast that even during the time of researching and writing this paper, things changed. New um, headsets were released, um, uh, advances in augmented reality headsets we were seeing as well. So it's, it's, um, it's shifting fast. So design thinking a little bit for the future. <clears throat> um, consider different design um, uh, differences for different hazards. Um, Implement user testing systems as you go along to make sure the design is matching user needs and expectations. Don't take anything for granted. I think a lot of the case studies we reviewed had a, a very good kind of iteration process of going back and forth and checking in, um, which um, made a, a much more successful end result. Um, and then designing experiences to avoid motion sickness, particularly in virtual reality, um, is, is, really, is really critical as well. Um, in terms of content, um, there is a lot of really excellent content out there. Um, in the Red Cross movement, for example, the Climate Center has um, lots of really great um, games and other ways of translating complex topics into digestible, fun, um, interactive activities that could be used, um, digitized and used for immersive technology approaches as well. Um, Bring the experts along. So in the humanitarian sector, we can't do everything ourselves. Um, we need to try and deliver as high quality experiences as possible to have the most impact, of course, making sure that they are scalable um, and practical. Um, but really good to use, use experts alongside that journey. Um, consider including a guide inside the experience as well for extra immersion. So, Including a guide in the experience can make the user feel more immersed and more integrated. Um, we've seen examples of when this is not done, that levels of immersions are lower um, because it's a bit harder to connect with the topic. Um, health and safety and age recommendations, really important to consider what technology is appropriate for which ages. You can check our age review um, and tech table um, in the research for that. Um, and just make sure to pro provide clearly articulated psych the social guidance um, and take a cautious approach. This is quite an under-researched field at the moment. Um, Production-wise, um, regularly check in with intended learning outcomes during production as well. User testing is really important for this too. Um, Distribution-wise, plan distribution and sustainability from the inception, like with any good um, project. Um, Proposal looking at these things from the beginning um, and like any good forward planning process. Um, licensing rights is something interesting. We came across a couple of examples um, of organizations who had worked with third parties who didn't retain the licensing rights and therefore this really impacted on the ability to scale those experiences um, and control them. Um, so important to guarantee you have those licensing rights. Um, really strongly involving school administrations is very positive um, to ensure wider distribution and overall success. Um, and um, when you're looking to adapt the experiences to other locations, which presumably most people will want to make something that is able to be scalable and adaptable, um, we found from the case studies that um, some examples of when the experiences were just merely translated to another language didn't really work. It's important to have cultural adaptations and customizations as well. Um, and then partnerships. So um, it's really great um, to partner with academic institutions and other parties that really understand 
risks, challenges, and opportunities, um, and that are yeah really willing to take risks. Um, we came across wonderful examples of experiences that are you know breaking boundaries because organizations and the tech firms that they were working with were were willing to take um, risks and go where people hadn't gone before, um, driving innovation. Um, so just to leave you with. The, our top recommendations that are more linked to defining um, the approach and learning outcomes. So firstly, um, don't be led by the tech. Um, please do define your intended learning outcomes first um, during project conception and then choose the technology and approach to meet the learning needs. Um, uh, there are already really great things going on out there. We don't need to re recreate those, but we can use this technology. We can really harness the unique affordances that it has, um, the different types of immersive technology to bring added value to what is already there and what is already working. Um, and then um, integrating um, immersive technologies into a broader educational approach is really fundamental. Having standalone experiences um, don't usually have the same impact as if they're integrated into a training module or curriculum um, where um, the, what people experience in the simulation can be explained. You can make sure you have a health and safety approach as well. Um, it has much more impact that way. Um, so thank you, Mandy. That's here's a snapshot of the ten case studies that we have uh, documented. You can find them uh, on the prepared website. Uh, the prepared website. Um, and uh, if you haven't yet downloaded, you can download the research study from this link from preparecenter.org topics. Immersive Technologies is a 275 page analysis with the uh, meta-analysis, case studies and also a link to the technology review. You can also follow the topic of Immersive Technologies on the GDPC website. Um, and just before turning over to questions, just wanted to thank you all so much for um, being here today. Um, we are really keen to continue this conversation. You can find our contact details here. We're really passionate about this topic. And if you have any questions or would like to speak to us, please do get in touch. Um, and I think, I'm sorry, we've taken slightly longer than we were probably supposed to, but there is so much interesting content that, we, as it was, we had to trim it down quite substantially. But um, I guess it's time for some questions. Great. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you, Estella, for sharing your really interesting and insightful research. Um, I think that was a great summary of your excellent report and case studies, which we've, of course, uh, encourage everyone to read as they even further capture um, the important points raised today. So now I'm going to open up the floor uh, to questions that I'll be reading from the chat box. So the first question is, um, do, you, do any of the VR tools you reviewed have built-in outcome measurements, especially something more complex like critical thinking ability? Um, from the tools we have reviewed, we haven't encountered any built-in outcome measurements. However, most, most of the tools are, are designed with um, measurements in place, but they're not totally connected as there's still a sort of um, this connection between the expected outcome and the result achieved uh, by, the, by, the, by the user. Um, some, some of the best uh, tools that we've seen they link, you know, use with outcomes are the ones that involve uh, user feedback, such as evaluations or surveys. Um, but yes, we've not seen something totally integrated yet, so it will be an area definitely to, to explore. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from Madagascar, um, asking if you could share your experience in a country or maybe an area where technology is not available to all young people and children. I would say probably that goes for many, many places um, where there's um, limited techno technological availability or, or basically where it hasn't really kind of gone to the last mile. Um, 
as it were. Um, I think one of the things that we looked at in this research that's really important is thinking about how to scale these kind of experiences to contexts where um, there isn't that much exposure to these types of technologies yet. Um, we have quite a few learnings from the case studies where um, uh, experiences that require quite a bit of technological support have tried to be scaled in areas um, and with organizations where perhaps they hadn't been so used to working with these technologies in the past and that can sometimes be a downfall. Um, and so um, this, these are some of our key considerations of thinking about scalability is, um, you know, how not only about cost, um, which is obviously something that comes um, to mind, um, but also about how to make sure some of the more easy to use um, technological options are available. Um, of course, it's possible to train people, um, but flying people around to train them and then going back to their countries and having to roll out across the whole country can be a little bit challenging. Um, so it's, you know, trying to get the balance between the technology and the scalability um, in places, some places where these technologies might not be that available or known about yet. Um, I think we recommend that probably that you read the uh, CICA 360 case study. Uh, that is one of our 10 case studies. Um, in this case, they used uh, smartphones and um, tablets rather than, you know, uh, virtual reality headsets only. Um, to be able to, to scale more. So that might be a solution uh, where, you know, the devices you're using can also be used for other purposes, not just for this uh, particular activity, but they can also be shared, for example, with your uh, IT department for other type of training or for other outreach or, you know, development activities. Thank you, Mandy and Stella. And I was also going to follow up a little bit on that question um, from the GDPC side, as after we received this research and analysis and the case studies, it made us think about how we can reach um, the last mile with this technology, but also making it an immersive experience that's available through other traditional means as well. So when you create a story or an experience that's available through VR to a certain audience, then made available in a different way and a different design through augmented reality to another audience. And then maybe making more traditional means like a comic book um, or pamphlets that also are centered around the same story. So we can try to reach uh, as many young people and children as possible. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next question, which is, uh, Sandra would like to know how you address safeguarding and data protection with minors, children, and parental consent for such approaches, considering national laws, etc. Mm -hmm. We have some some notes in our report on this. Um, we recommend uh, to use anonymous data, so not to uh, make children uh, log in into any of these experiences, but use uh, sort of a common login for, for the school, um, as well as, uh, you know, not allowing any tracking for third parties of, of the minors during their experience. And uh, in, re in regards to parental consent, this would be responsibility of the school to, to achieve that, that consent before the experiences are uh, rolled out. All right, thank you. Um, next question is extended reality uh, provides opportunities for use with children to learn in virtual environments, uh, but how should psychological aspects be thought of as it brings now children much more, much closer to real feelings of hazards and thus they might be affected strongly? Oh, and I'll also follow up as I got another question that was related to that directly, um, saying that they found the video for disaster scope really interesting and very realistic and how did the children receive um, that experience yeah you can see actually on the um so if you read the case study you'll be able to see the links um and and, and search on google for the this um the the people that created disaster scope for their also their youtube channel you can see lots of different how they've used it lots of different ways and you can see how the children react um, it is incredibly realistic um, and uh, and looks, I mean, it, it looks, 
like the water. And the, the, the um, example we showed you was with the new iPhone. Yeah. Um, and so this is this just came out just now. I mean, it's even since we published the the or finished the report, this has been an, an advancement. So it's changing very fast, incredibly realistic. So. Um, it's, I think that's why it's incredibly important to, to consider age um, and, um, and also that the experience isn't standalone. If you have a child put on a headset and they see their friends uh, around them being covered in water, it could be potentially very scary. So they need to be of an age where they understand it's a simulation. They also need to, it needs to be delivered as part of a package so that before they experience the simulation, they understand it's a simulation, this is why we're doing this. Um, this is what you need to do to avoid um, this particular hazard. This is how you could escape. Um, these are the safety messages. This is how you protect yourself. Um, these, this is what the government um, recommends, uh, et cetera, it, so that it's not just a standalone, really intense experience, but it, it comes fully supported with kind of, you know, that psychosocial support element as well. All right, thank you. Um, next question is wondering if the report studied the cost effectiveness of these technologies. For example, developing a VR game is costly, but it can only be played for a few students at a time. Um, we did look a little bit at um, cost effectiveness in terms of um, using technology like virtual reality for drills and simulations um, and did find that um, versus doing like school-wide large simulations that take up quite a lot of time um, and effort that actually um, these can be less expensive um, using immersive technology can be less expensive um, because it's also because it's less disruptive to school activities etc um so i guess this would depend a little bit on how it's rolled out as well um to make make sure that it is cost effective that all students are having the opportunity to experience it um that it's able to be scalable of course then you have to think of how many headsets you would need um and and how it would be um conducted so we did look at the topic a bit but i it, this could be another area for a bit more detailed research um to look a bit more into the, the costs yeah actually the, the tester scope um, basically because um, with VR you can uh, the VR experience is usually not longer than five minutes so depending on how how many uh, headsets you can offer an X amount of uh, students uh, provided you have resources for briefing the students and then the students are sort of queuing uh, to 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 do their experience but yeah it's a really good question that will have to be researched on a case by case thank you and i know we came up at the end of the hour but uh mandy and Estelle, if you're open to staying on a little bit longer and so are some of our participants we can address the other questions as well yeah sure yeah, absolutely yeah mm -hmm. all right great so i saw a follow-up question to um the one about costs that asked if maybe you provided an idea or recommendations on how um, practitioners or people can estimate how much budget would be needed to implement VR in a project? It really depends on if you want to create a new experience or um, license an existing experience. To create a new experience, we sort of have this number floating in the air i mean that is really difficult because it depends on your internal resources or external resources but um you know i wouldn't say a number but usually in uk we usually say with less than 20k you can't do anything um so that maybe gives you a bit of a an, um, you know a guidance however yeah we'll have to be looked at case by case and there's already people who are already thinking of um, offering licenses, which is which could be a really good solution, where in, rather than creating a full-on customized experience, you are licensing an, an experience that has already been tested, and what you have to do is rent the equipment, learn how it's done, and and put it in your, you know in, in your school. And again, we would stress that it's rather than saying, okay, we want to implement a VR. 
experience, it's better to look back to what we want to achieve by doing this, and then what is the best way of achieving that, which may be virtual reality, it may be another means. Um, and you could check out the disastrous code case study because they have a really interesting model of distribution. So they, um, this Japanese um, academic um, team uh, developed disaster scope and they actually work with a, a technology provider to license um, the product to schools. So schools actually sort of rent it as it were. They rent the equipment um, and the experience, um, which makes it quite an affordable way for schools to integrate this into what they're doing with fire and have created it themselves. Um, so that's quite an interesting model as well. However, because it's such an experimental and new field, we don't yet have answers to these questions. We really will have to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, you get in touch with us if you're interested in models that are presented in the case studies, because we may have some information on costings as long as it's fine with the, um, the owners of those products and those case studies to share them, in which in many cases they said it was okay. We might be able to give you a sense as well. So if you... Yeah, we do have some notes on, on cost uh, on, on our matrix. Uh, in, uh, during the research, you will read this kind of like a flow chart, which will allow you to kind of have an idea of if you have X amount of money, you could get this and that. Of course, if you, if you have 20,000 pounds or dollars, you would get maybe like a limited customer experience. However, if you have 100, you could have an, an interactive, full interactive experience um, made, made for you. Um, so yeah, some, some ideas. Thanks for that. And maybe we could also share the slide with your contact information again. Um, Casey wants to follow up with you. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, what is the position of pedagogical experts and education specialists in using VR and AR in education sector? For example, do they use this technology in schools in Finland for regular schooling? I don't know about the case of Finland specifically, but there is a lot of research on um, immersive technology for education, um, which we've reviewed quite a bit of in our, in, as part of the meta-analysis um, and literature review, there's quite a bit referenced there. So definitely take a look at the bibliography as well, where you can see some of those specific studies that have been done um, focusing on education, where there's massive amounts of potential um, not only in the education sector, but you know, VR has been used consistently across security, defense, um, training, training athletes. It's really shown to improve performance a lot. Um, and so, of course, it's been something that education has, um, has looked to, to harness um, and has become quite well integrated in curriculums in some countries like the United States. Um, where it's used quite a bit. I don't know about the case of Finland specifically, but I presume it's probably quite advanced there. It's just a guess. Um, I know that um, we have some colleagues from the Finnish Red Cross who um, were involved in uh, producing one of the um, Stay Safe VR, which is a, a security training VR um, experience as one of our case studies um, produced between IFRC and Trade cross, um, so they might be good people to contact to ask about the specific case of Finland. Unless this question is coming from one of you, <laughs> in which case. Great, thank you. Um, I think related to this question is another one, um, which is in your case studies or your research experience, how was the um, experience or relationship with the practitioners or the game designers in interacting with local or national governments and getting their buy in in the technological tools? Um, so this has been something where a couple of our case studies focus on um, are we're really looking at the intersection of school disaster preparedness um, and hazards and um, for example one that springs to mind is the disaster preparedness simulator in the Philippines that um, a design lab called Ania Design Lab um, came up with um, and they were the ones that had this really in intensive co design process that they worked with national authorities um, to develop, make sure that the messaging in the experience was aligned with um, national requirements. Um, I think um, this is really, really fundamental. Um, the more you can integrate these experiences into the national curriculum on disaster management, which is often, um, of course, um, led by, by governments um, in terms of setting the agenda, um, the more 
the more impact it will have um, because you don't want to be a you know coming out with messages that are not aligned with national requirements um, and be or, you know getting uh, in the way of um, of delivering those messages. So I think um, what we've seen a few examples in the case studies of where that happens and it has really good results. Um, we've seen examples of when that doesn't happen or perhaps when disaster um, messages are not developed with the experts, um, but are developed by, let's say, a media company um, who doesn't necessarily work with the right experts. And again, that can lead to problems because you're not, um, you're not necessarily giving people the right advice, which is obviously not what we want to be doing. So um, yes, please do work as much as possible with government counterparts to align messaging. And also it will help them to be able to promote the experience at the national scale. Right, I think that's a great question and a great point. Thank you. Um, our last question, uh, which I think provides a great opportunity for a summary is, do you, can you speak to your research that proves that XR approaches is better than traditional approaches in terms of achieving the learning outcomes you mentioned? Um, and they question, if not, why should we invest money and resources into developing XR? So um, I would come back to our main point here of um, stressing that we, we do not want to advocate that XR replaces traditional methods. Um, many traditional methods are working very well. However, they do have some shortcomings, um, which we've outlined in this presentation. And please do go to the report to read more about those shortcomings and how we feel that XR can really fill some of those gaps. We really believe strongly that immersive technologies can add a level of realism and experience and learning by doing um, that are very hard to get through traditional methods and, and can provide a really fantastic complement to the great work that's already going on across the sector. So we'd really encourage you to consider um, developing something, but just please do bear in mind that think about what you want to change and what you want to achieve first and your learning outcomes first um, before figuring out if this kind of technology fits the bill. And sometimes it will and sometimes it won't, but we really do believe strongly in, in the potential for immersive technologies. Great, thank you both. And thank you everyone for your questions and for this discussion. Um, I think as the participation highlighted, there really is a lot of opportunity for more collaboration and more learning in this space. So, we at GDPC are exploring the interest in creating an online group um, with forums and continued webinars where we would further discuss and share our work and research and overall ideas on this, this uh, ever evolving topic. So if this is of interest to you, please answer our Zoom poll that probably just popped up on your page. Um, or if you'd like to email us about it directly, you may contact us at GDPC at redcross.org as you see on the slide there. Um, yeah, we look forward to hearing from you. And once again, thank you, Mandy and Estella, for sharing your research, which is really of great value to our work. And thank you to everyone for your time today. And we look forward to further learning with all of you in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. And thanks so much to everyone who participated in the research. Thank you. Thank you all.